Okay, good morning. This is Richard Shu of the host of Shoe Untied. Uh, this morning, I'm really thrilled and honored to have with me as my guest, Larry Brilliant, who needs no introduction. Larry, welcome to the program. Richard, it is wonderful, and I'm so excited. I didn't know you live in San Francisco. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Larry, let me just say that you are the first guest that I have had that agreed to come onto my show because of Big Bird. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. I figured that anybody who interviewed Big Bird had to be a cool dude. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I I never would have dreamed that would have been the hook, but okay. That, it worked. That, that, that was the hook. I get a I, lot of requests, but you know, I've never had anybody who had interviewed Big Bird. <laughs> <laughs> now, Larry, my burning question to you is how did you grow up in your life with the last name of Brilliant? I mean, that just must have set such a high standard. Uh, what was that like? Well, for one, I didn't have any choice. <laughs> and uh, it, it's actually, a, it's a wonderful name on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays <laughs> when I'm good. But if I screw up, it's a really tough name. But and didn't it just set such a high expectation of what people expected from you? So I wrote a book called Sometimes Brilliant, which the, the, even hearing it, I still get the heebie-jeebies. It's just don't like, one like, doesn't like to see one's name used as a, a kind of a, a sight joke. Uh -huh. But I, I insisted that inside on the first page, right after it said Sometimes Brilliant, yeah. it says, and sometimes not so. <laughs> well sometime during this podcast i'm gonna say larry that's brilliant <laughs> it's great when i'm in ireland because everything's brilliant there <laughs> <laughs> i mean when you must turn your head every time somebody says that's brilliant <laughs> so it's a funny story but i didn't know the origin of my name so all the immigrants who came to the united states in the 40s and the 50s especially after the war uh, or many of the immigrants every immigrant's got a different story but yeah at least in my community people called wherever they came from the old country yes it didn't matter where it was so i didn't know the origin of the name brilliant and it wasn't unusual because my family everybody had the name brilliant yes but i was working for the united nations and i was in india and i was working in the world health organization's program to eradicate smallpox and uh, i was the youngest person on the team and uh, one month, all of the top people, uh, D.A. Henderson, Bill Fagey, Nicole Grasset, had were out of the country doing other things. And they left me in charge. I was 23, 24 mm -hmm. years old. And um, while I was in charge, a Russian epidemiologist who was part of the hundreds of people that we had working in the program had been accused, a caught of uh, having uh, sex with a a young girl, a mm -hmm. tribal girl. Mm -hmm. And the Indian government decided to kick him out mm -hmm. of India. And they, they, they do what they call, they gave him a quit India notice. So somebody had to go get him and take him to the airport. And because he was working in the smallpox program, and I was for five days or 10 days, whatever it was at that time, the quote head of the program, I had to do it. So I did. Uh, he was very angry. His brother was the health minister of the Soviet Union. He, uh, I took him to the airport unceremoniously. We took all of his bags and baggages, and I made sure that he got on the Aeroflot flight. And then I came home, and I didn't think very much of it. The next day, I get a call from uh, a physician working for the World Health Organization named Lazarenko, and he asked me if I would come with my wife and have dinner with him, and we did. I didn't know what his role was, Turned out he was the commissar. Mm -hmm. He was the head of the Russians uh, and the Soviets working in India at that time, not just in WHO, but everywhere. And he told me uh, in a kind of funny way, but in a menacing way, he said, Dr. Brilliant, you must allow this doctor back into India. And I said, well, I can't do it. I All I did was, I'm just the driver. I just mm -hmm. went to the airport. I, he said, no, Dr. Billing, you must do this or it will be bad for your people. Mm -hmm. And I said, what people? Mm -hmm. He said, well, your people who are living in Belarusia. I said, I don't have any people living in Belarusia. <laughs> he says, look, Dr. Billing, we know that your real name is Brilliantov. 
<laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I don't know anything about Brilliantov. He said, yes, your family lives in a village called Melnitskov. I didn't know anything about a village named Melnitskov. He said it will go bad for your people. And he showed me pictures, black and white pictures of people living in a village. And he said, that's your great aunt three times removed. And I said, I know nothing about this. Funny. And he said, you have to do it. I said, look, besides that, I can't do it. He got an airplane. He left. He said, Dr. Brilliant, you know so little about us. He is still here. The moment you left, we went on that airplane. We took him off. He's in the Russian embassy right now. <laughs> so I called uh, my friends in the Indian government, and this time they removed him. <clears throat> But years and years later, when we had uh, eradicated smallpox, and I, had, my wife and I had gone to the University of Michigan, she got her PhD, and I became a professor there. <clears throat> But we really wanted to come back to Mill Valley. We love Mill Valley. Uh, and when we were coming back to Mill Valley and someone asked me about the origin of my name, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I was told it was Brilliantov. I'd never seen any evidence of that. And that uh, my parents, uh, my father at least, had been born in a village called Melnitskov. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, well, do you know what that means, Melnitskov? I said, no, I don't know what that means. He said, well, that means Mill Valley. <laughs> There you go. Who would make this stuff up? I mean, really. <laughs> so, Larry, let me ask you. You've had such an illustrious career. You've done so many interesting things. You've traveled around the world. Is it all over? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you know? May, you, you may know something. I don't know. <laughs> But tell me if you had to pick, say, the two or three highlights in your mind when you think about all the things you've done, all the travels, all the people you've met what would you say they would be? Can I have four? <laughs> sure, you can have four. Uh, m meeting Martin Luther King and, um, and marching with him. Uh, meeting my wife um, uh, when she was 15 and I was 16 and being married for 53 years. Wow. Uh, meeting my guru, Neem Karoli Baba, and living in an ashram in the Himalayan foothills with him and so many wonderful people. And meeting Wavy Gravy, uh, who was uh, with Ken Kesey, part of the Merry Pranksters and head of the hog farm. And Wavy and his wife and my wife and I have been friends for 50 years. He's my best friend. Well, very interesting that the four things you picked are all people that you've met. It wasn't about any of your accomplishments or anything like that. Uh, tell me, a little, tell me, pick one of those people and tell me a little bit why it was so amazing and why it had such an impact on you. So first, I think if... If for a moment we can all be humble and uh, and be honest and look back on our lives at those crossroads, those sentinel moments, mm. and ask yourself honestly, how many of the greatest things that happened to you because you were so damn smart mm. or you could see the future? Mm. Or how many of them were because of people that you met mm. who influenced you in a way? Mm. And, and I think if you're honest, most of you, most of the time. The greatest things that happened to you were not because of you, mm. but they were because of other people in your life. Yeah, yeah. And and that's something, you know, uh, uh, the, the famous uh, uh, Georgian, Greek, uh, uh, Sufi, uh, 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 Uspensky and... Um, They wrote this book called Meetings with Remarkable Men. He, he should have said Meetings with Remarkable People. Mm -hmm. And it's an amazing book um, about the people that he met and the way that they changed his life. Mm -hmm. And I felt the same way. That's the, the, uh, Everything that I've ever done is, is due to the people that I've met um, mm -hmm. and, and what I learned from them. Well, pick one of those four people and tell me a little bit about what they, you know, why it was such a big impact. Well, I mean, uh, they're all, imp I mean, it, it, we'll start with Martin Luther King because uh, when I was a, a, a junior at the University of Michigan, my father was dying of mm. cancer mm. and I was having a very rough time mm. and I didn't understand the meaning of life. I still, <laughs> big, big, big question. What is the meaning of life? I didn't understand um, 
anything. I, I was so depressed. And I had locked myself in my dorm room uh, and I, I didn't go outside for weeks at a time. Uh, didn't go to classes. And I saw a little tiny article in the Michigan Daily newspaper, the, the college newspaper, that said that this man, Martin Luther King, was coming to campus. He wasn't famous yet. He hadn't won his Nobel mm. Prize. Mm. Mississippi summer hadn't happened yet. Mm. But there was something about it. And I got out of my shell and I walked to this huge auditorium that seats 3,000 people, Hill Auditorium. Mm. Uh, and it was raining and snowing. And sometimes in Ann Arbor, the rain uh, actually falls, seems to fall horizontally, not vertically. It was a terrible storm. Mm -hmm. And only about 50 or 100 students came to that talk. Hmm. And uh, when Dr. King was introduced by the president of the University of Michigan, the president was angry that more students hadn't come and apologetic. Mm -hmm. But Martin Luther King got up and he said, he said, laughing and laughing, he said, you know what? there's just a few of you there's more of me to go around come mm. on up on stage mm. and we all came on stage it was a parquet floor and we sat around him and he spoke in a way that i'd never heard anyone say you've all heard him uh, quoted as saying that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice mm. but what he said to us that day was the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. The world will be a better place. Hmm. But that arc does not bend towards justice by itself. You have got, got to get off your ass and get out up and grab that arc and bend it and twist it and pull it towards justice or it ain't going to go there. Hmm. And when he said that, he was saying, don't be so depressed about the world hmm. and don't be so hopeless but also understand that there's something each of you can do mm. to make the world a better place mm. and in saying that he said there's something you can do that mm. provides meaning to your life mm. and none of us were ever the same we all went down to mississippi that summer we all joined in those days sds or because that was starting at the university of michigan or the alphabet soup uh, naacp SNCC, core mm -hmm. um, we fought against the war in Vietnam. And when I was a medical student, only a few years later, uh, I joined the Medical Committee for Human Rights, which was the group that marched with Martin Luther King. And we wore our white lab coats with our stethoscopes dangling ostentatiously, hoping that somehow if we formed a phalanx around Dr. King, we would protect him from getting beaten up. That was our, and it was the privilege of my life. Um, Mm. I was, I was, I say arrested. That's not exactly true. We were detained, mm. Dr. King and uh, hundreds of other people in Chicago. Um, but what the cops, the cops had to build a fence at, you know, Grant, I think it's called Grant Park and around us with Dr. King. But uh, Peter, Paul and Mary were also arrested and they sang <laughs> uh, and we had rock and roll thing. And I heard Dr. King sing Amazing Grace. Mm. And that's just like, what mm. it just it's like you know arrest me again <laughs> if this is what it's like mm. that was astonishing and understanding that his commitment to nonviolence was mm. so deep and so real and when we practiced and sat on you know counters at Woolworth and had people come behind us and hit us on the back to practice and not move and not retaliate mm. um, his Gandhian message mm. is something that, that I'll always keep with me. He, and and uh, also a great Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese uh, uh, Zen Buddhist who famously wrote the, the poem about the, the Vietnam uh, boat people and the captain who rapes someone on that boat and sinks mm. the boat. And mm. now he says, you must understand that, that you are part of that. You mm. cannot separate yourself from the evil in the world, mm. and for, nor from the good. Mm. They were all friends with Dr. King in a, mm. a meaningful group of people mm. who really cared so much about the world, but would only advance the cause of peace and justice mm. through not violence. Mm. Tell me about Wavy Gravy. Don't know anything about that. So Wavy is my best friend. Uh, he was the uh, master of ceremonies at Woodstock. Mm. Uh, he's famous for saying... 
what I have in mind is breakfast in bed for 400,000. <laughs> and if you see the Woodstock movie, you'll see him uh, in his jumpsuit. Um, he, um, Wavy leads and has led, or if there is a leader, he's the leader of uh, one of the offshoots of the Merry Pranksters called the Hog Farm. Hmm. It's a commune. It has a, a house in Berkeley and a and a land in Mendocino and Laytonville, where there's also a kids camp, Camp Winter Rainbow. Hmm. Um, and when I uh, when when I was an intern at Presbyterian Hospital um, in 1969, 1970, a group of Native Americans took over Alcatraz, hmm. and uh, Herb Cain was the columnist. And I don't know if you knew him, Richard. Of course. And he would say every week he would. Uh, in his column say, there's a woman, an Indian living on the island, part of the occupation. She's nine months pregnant. There's no water. There's no doctor. There's no medicine. Isn't there a doctor anywhere in the Bay Area that will go and live on the island and help her to deliver her baby? Mm -hmm. And then as she got closer, he got more strident. Is there no doctor? Is there no doctor? So of course I thought, okay, well, that's an ad for Larry. So I went out and lived on the island and, um, I learned so much from all the tribes who were there, the Lakota Sioux, the Mohawks, the Hopis. Um, and I helped her deliver her baby. And um, the baby was named Wavoka, hmm. named after the Paiute Sioux Indian medicine man who created the ghost dance. And when Wavoka was born on the island, it was a kind of messianic moment on the island. And, hmm. and one of the Indians who had been a, a Green Beret uh, had taken a little bit too many drugs and he sliced his wrist hmm. uh, saying Wavoka is born I can die now hmm. and I I would sew it up and he would tear it apart again and cut he was bleeding too much for me to sew up the Coast Guard brought a boat and evacuated us hmm. I'm trying to sew him up he's trying to tear it off the waves and the, it was very bloody I got blood all over me and we landed um, the wonderful ambulances took him immediately to the San Francisco General. There was no room in the ambulance for me. So I was standing there and it seemed like every television camera in the world was there. Hmm. And they pointed cameras in my face and said, what do the Indians want? I had never met an Indian until six months, six weeks before. Um, and of course I had no answer, but I must've said something because the next day I get a call from Warner Brothers asking me if I would like to have a part in a, a very small, insignificant part in a movie, hmm. which was about the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane, all the rock and roll bands, hmm. going from uh, California back to England, recreating the Pilgrims visit in reverse. Hmm. So my wife and I thought about it, and we thought, rock and roll, you know, that'd be cool. Hmm. And so we took our little Westphalia German, you know, micro bus, and yeah. we were the caboose on this uh, caravan of 20 buses. Uh, but the first day when we met at Pier 27 or 29 and uh, the, 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 uh, the parade of buses were getting outfitted with our costumes and everything for the movie, we were signing in. Um, the first person that I saw there when we, we got in was this fellow standing on a, um, I don't know, everybody was, it was like we were in a, in a uh, down uh, in a basement area and standing up on one of the railings was this guy wearing a duck bill hat with a real ducks, real bill. <laughs> and when he smiled, I saw that his teeth were rainbow colored. He had had rainbow enamel colors put on his mouth. I said, I don't think I've ever met anybody like that. <laughs> so I introduced myself to him as the doctor on the caravan and we became friends. Um, and we, we took that, uh, that bus ride all the way to Kathmandu. Of course, we had to change buses when we got to. I'm I'm guessing from all this that you're a very big music fan, or you're really into music. Yes. Well, I'm really into, uh, you know, I'm I'm a creature of rock and roll. Yes. Uh, but the only musical instrument that I have are my ears. <laughs> so I just, I just want to make that very clear. I, I I can't I can't even keep a tune, but a beat. But I love rock and roll music. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Now, it says on your Wikipedia page, you had a very close friendship with Steve Jobs. Uh, tell me a little bit about how, how that happened and how, your, your relationship with him. Uh, another one of these incredible people that uh, I was fortunate uh, 
blessed enough to meet. Uh, so we had, uh, so my wife and I, that, that caravan of hippies, uh, which took us through Iran and we lived in Afghanistan and Iraq and Pakistan and India. And we wound up in Nepal. And then we wound up in this uh, ashram, which is sort of, if you look at the map of India, it's at the corner where India and Nepal and Tibet meet. Mm -hmm. So we we lived there. We had read uh, Be Here Now. We had met uh, Ram Das when he had come to San Francisco and, and given uh, three lectures on Thursday nights at the Unitarian Church in 1969, 1970. And when we were in India, we said, well, let's go where Ram Das, uh, my wife said, let's go where Ram Das went. So we went and lived uh, with Neem Karoli Baba, who became our teacher. Mm -hmm. And it was a magical time. Uh, the people who came there included Steve Jobs and, 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 and Ram Das and Danny Goleman and Mira Bush and so many wonderful people, mm -hmm. Krishna Das. Um, and Steve got there late. Uh, he, he arrived in India months after Neem Karoli Baba had died. Hmm. And by then, Neem Karoli Baba had sent me to go work for WHO and the smallpox program and had predicted in a way that I don't understand to this day, that smallpox would be eradicated and that, um, and this was God's gift to humanity, um, because of the hard work of dedicated health workers. That's what he said. Hmm. Um, so I was, by then I had every day kind of shaved my beard incrementally it, it, it was down to the middle of my belly but by the time i finally got the job at who i had trimmed goatee and i'd gotten rid of my ashram clothes which looked like a long white gown and i'd put on a tie and a suit and i was now working as a, a diplomat a u.n medical officer and um, i was in my office one day and the uh, receptionist at the who office uh, called me in the name of Mrs. Boyer, and she said, uh, "Larry, there's a there's a dirty hippie here. He's barefoot. He doesn't look like he's had a shower in days. He actually looks just like you when you first came here. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he says he he's here to meet you. So I came down. I didn't know who he was. He's, I said, what, "What can I do for you?" He says, "I'm hungry. I want a I want a green salad." <laughs> he had been in uh, in India for six months, and, and this is this is Steve Jobs. Well, yes, I didn't know it at the time who Steve Jobs was, and he right. didn't he didn't know who he was at that time either. Well, had right? he had he started Apple or anything at that? No, time? no, 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 no. He, was, all he, was, he was like the rest of us on the on what we think of as the kind of ordinary career path of the '60s. You yes. in India, you meet holy people, you learn a little bit more about the world that you didn't know about, and, and you get sick from diarrhea. That's That was part of our training yeah, program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he didn't want to eat a salad because uh, they were very hard to get a, a safe, clean salad in those days in India. Yeah. And he wanted a place that was air conditioned, and we had that in WHO. <laughs> so I took him to lunch in the WHO canteen, and he had his green salad, and he had his air conditioning, and we talked. Cool. And um, he seemed like a nice enough fellow. Um, he hadn't yet uh, had that vision of a computer that could think in color, yeah, which really, led really. to him starting Apple. But our friendship developed from that. Wow. And when we both came back, uh, he came back after six months in India. I came back years later after we had eradicated smallpox. Uh, and I had started the Seva Foundation. He wrote me and told me that uh, he wanted to make a donation and help Seva. Um, and he, um, and he did, he made, he, he, he gave me the money to start the Seva Foundation, which is, uh, as of today, given back sight to more than 5 million blind people. Wow. I don't know that we ever would have had the money to get started if Steve hadn't given us the money. And he joined our board of directors. Bobby Ware joined our board of directors. Wavy was on our board of directors. Ram Dass was, but we also had, you know, the head of the smallpox program, epidemiologists from CDC, ophthalmologists from um, California Pacific and um, UCSF. And Steve was a really important part of that. Um, but over the years, our friendship deepened. Um, hmm. And I, I was with him in the last few days of his life. Wow. Um, we'd, we would always go for walks. He loved to go for walks and talk. Um, hmm. We'd go from his house to a, a, 
uh, a sushi joint in uh, uh, University Avenue in Palo Alto, mm. or to get a smoothie. That was mm. sort of our. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. Did you know? Through. Did you know Lawrence Levy, who I think was pretty close with Steve too? Does that name ring a bell at all? Sure, sure, rings a bell. Didn't know him very well. Okay, yeah, yeah I think so. And then when you mentioned the India thing, you said Danny Goldman. Is that the Daniel Goldman who wrote Emotional Intelligence? Yeah, he's another very close friend of mine, and oh. he's he's very he's very often here at our house in Mill Valley. Oh. Uh, so Danny, who we, we actually call him Juggy, because he got the name Juggernaut Das, like Ram Das was Ram Das and Krishna Das was Krishna. Das. I always felt bad I didn't get a Das name, like the Das Brothers, you know. Um, so Danny. Um, yeah, he uh, <clears throat> he had just got his PhD in uh, psychology at Harvard. Yes, uh, and he was studying uh, Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka. And then he came, and he met and stayed with Maharaji, and um, then he came back and wrote many many books. Uh, he personally thinks that book, uh, Emotional Intelligence, was his worst book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's so funny because I, I recently just had Daniel Goldman as my guest. So, Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, yeah. He was like two guests ago, two or three guests. Anyway, so, so I mean, you being on here is perfect. And I've, and I've had Steve Wozniak, who... So it's yeah, like sure, you, sure. Between yeah, Wozniak and you sure. and Daniel Goldman, it's a... And Lawrence Levy as well, too. So it's like... Well, you're cornering the market. <laughs> but, but I don't know what it is that you're cornering the market in. <laughs> But I'm Danny, the for, I'm Danny's the wonderful. Of brilliant people. <laughs> Danny's really, Danny's really wonderful. Yeah, he's really wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, Larry, look, tell me a little bit about. So, what are you working on now? I didn't mean to suggest you're retiring at all. Tell me what you're currently doing and what what are you working on these days? Uh, well, uh, a bunch of things. Um, I've been writing a lot in uh, Foreign Affairs and the Wall Street Journal about the pandemic. Mm. Um, I'm a CNN medical analyst, um, so I've done over a hundred. Uh, talks on CNN. Mm. Um, and I have a little consulting firm uh, called mm. Pan Defense. And that's several dozen epidemiologists and virologists and uh, from all over. And we, uh, you know, sometimes when people ask us to help with either the pandemic or disease prevention, we'll put together a group of people who are available. Mm. Almost everybody's a professor or in an agency, um, but they always have time to do a little consulting. Uh, and I'm, I've just agreed to, starting this summer, do a monthly column in Time Magazine hmm. on uh, science and religion. Oh, interesting. Uh, I think that will help us understand climate change, the response mm. to pandemics. I'm, mm. uh, I'm, I'm personally uh, disappointed uh, in the civil rights movement that was a movement that went from church to synagogue to temple to church. Mm. Uh, it was of the church, but in the current fight for justice and equality, I ask myself, where is the church? Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Also, it seems like during the pandemic, um, the right wing Republicans, is no other way to say it, have become the leaders of the QAnon anti vax anti-science, anti-truth movement. Mm. And I can't square the circle mm. between being a Christian mm. and supporting lies and um, not supporting mm. a fight for justice and equality. I just, don't, I just don't understand it. I think by writing this column, I will learn more about it and, um, and maybe be helpful to the climate movement, which desperately needs the help of... Um, of religious people, people of faith, and people who are not religious and not of faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little about your time at Google. You were were you not the first CEO of Google.org? Weren't you the first? I, I was. I yeah. was. Yeah. 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 Tell me a little about that. How was that? How was that like? Um, well, again, it all like so many things in my life. It happened so by happenstance, I guess. So uh, when the tsunami hit um, um, in uh, Indonesia, it also affected Sri Lanka and India in a great way. You may remember the picture of those trains turning over by the force of the waves that were so powerful. And that was a village called Hikadua in Sri Lanka. Mm. So uh, they were asking for volunteers to work in the um, refugee camps as, mm. and, as a doctor. Mm. So I was a doctor and Seva had a lot of programs in Southeast Asia. So people had sent us cash mm. <laughs> and said, uh, use it to help um, the people who are you know, displaced or hurt, injured by the tsunami. So I took a, a briefcase full of cash to uh, 
uh, Southeast Asia and began distributing it to uh, NGOs because that's what they need. They need cash. There's no wire transfers. There's no bank. In the middle of a disaster like that. Mm. Uh, and I uh, and then I volunteered in the refugee camps for a couple of weeks in Southeast Asia. And when I came back, um, uh, I noticed that in the Southeast Asia, I had expected in the camps what they would be worried about health wise. Mm -hmm. was diarrheal diseases and mosquitoes that would change their i mean you'd get more salt water loving mosquitoes and i thought they'd worry about dengue fever but what they were talking about was bird flu mm -hmm. and h5n1 and the risk that it posed to civilization and the head of who came and visited the refugee camp and he spoke about the fear that bird flu could create a pandemic of Mm. disastrous proportions. Mm. And I didn't know very much about that, even though I was an epidemiologist. Mm. So I um, I came back and I, I, I put together a meeting. That was the first pan defense meeting. Mm. And I brought people from WHO and the UN and CDC and NIH and people, we all met. Uh, and one of the people at that meeting uh, nominated me for the TED Prize. Mm. Uh, so I was given a TED Prize, which I, my timing was a little off. The TED Prize now, TED Audacious, is $150 million. When I got it, it was $100,000. I, need, I needed that money. It was wonderful. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I, I think my timing was off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when I got the TED Prize, they asked me to go and uh, and speak at big companies, in especially in Silicon Valley, so that they could raise the money to, in addition to the 100000 give me money to uh, fulfill my wish. And my wish was to stop the next pandemic. Mm -hmm. So one of the places that I spoke at was Google. Mm -hmm. And um, I gave my usual talk about, we eradicated smallpox. We should be able to stop the next pandemic, but we're not prepared. And I didn't know that Larry Page and uh, Sergey Brin and, uh, and Sheryl Sandberg and uh, Eric Schmidt were in my audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, the next day, uh, Cheryl Sandberg called me and said, "Would I like to um, be the uh, be a vice president of Google and to be um, the head of this foundation uh, that had two billion dollars of money to give away?" That, and of course, I said no <laughs> because I didn't want to work for a big company. And then um, uh, John Doerr, who became a good friend of mine, and um, Oh God, uh, John Pritzker and so many folks, they they put pressure on me. They said, you should do this. You should really do this. And I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was a wonderful time. Um, uh, Google was very kind to me. My son died uh, during that period. And oh, it was a very hard time. And I, I, I can't tell you how kind and good uh, the folks at Google were to me during that, the hardest time in my life. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to them forever for what they did. Yeah, yeah. Well, Larry, this has been such a wonderful conversation. It's such a privilege to talk to you and hear, just hear your stories. Um, I would love to check in with you and keep in touch and hear what else you, what you else got going to be doing. You know, uh, be, be, after you called, I started listening to your podcast. I didn't know you inter interviewed Danny, yeah. but I want to thank you for what you're doing. There's a lot of podcasts and a lot of podcasters but I really enjoy your combination of uh, humility, humor, uh, curiosity, and kindness. Thank you. Larry, it's been a pleasure. This is Richard Shue and Larry Brilliant. Thank you.